In this video I want to show you how to make a smart TV box from start to finish. Or actually, how to make a decent smart TV box out of a broken tablet. What do we need? We need to have an old broken tablet. It doesn't really have to be old, but it's important that in its current state you have no valid purpose for it. I think it's called useless. An ideal tablet would be one that has a broken display, touchscreen or both, and that you have no intention of repairing it. The important thing is that the mainboard is working properly. In other words, a tablet that you can most probably buy for 5 to 10 bucks. And of course, we need some tools. I'm using a broken generic TPC8140. It is preferable to have a configuration or specification that is able to perform functions for which you want to use it. In my case, it should be able to run video playback and video streaming applications. For example, movies from a local server using Wi-Fi, also YouTube and Netflix, but primarily Netflix. The key factor is that it has an HDMI output so it can be connected to a TV. The size of the tablet screen is irrelevant and the screen resolution does not play any role as long as the resolution on the HDMI output can be adjusted independently. And certainly you have what you have. This tablet has an 8 inch display with a resolution of 1024 by 768. But on the HDMI output it can reproduce resolutions from 720 by 480 up to 9020 by 1080 pixels at 50 or 60 Hz depending on the selected resolution. I do not intend to use it with a resolution higher than 1280 by 720, so I am good. The motherboard of the tablet has a rock chip Cortex A9 RK3188T, which is equipped with 4 cores clocked slightly above 1.4 GHz. The RK3188T is a slightly stripped down version of RK3188 CPU, which if my memory serves me well, runs at 1.8 or 1.9 GHz and has several small advantages. More details about this tablet can be found at the link in the description of this video. It also has 1GB of RAM and 8GB of storage memory. For streaming will be quite enough. And maybe it can run some games, but not really an issue. If you need more storage space, there is a microSD slot that is expendable for an additional 32 gigs. It also supports OTG on the USB port, so it is possible to connect a USB mouse or even a USB keyboard. In addition to wireless, there is also a Bluetooth module. So what's the goal? I do not want to use it in the form of a tablet that is connected to the TV, because it's broken, it's old and its battery is bad, and the battery requires to be taken care of, to be charged and discharged, to perform cycles. And when it's constantly plugged in into the charger, then it will constantly overcharge, which is also not good. But I will be happy to cover this battery topic in a separate video. I just want to connect the motherboard to a DC adapter and possibly a Bluetooth keyboard or mouse and pack it all in some unusual housing, which will stand next to the TV so that everyone asks me dumb question, what's that for? Even if it was just a shoebox. The disassemble video of this tablet you can watch on, in a separate video on my other channel Link in the description of this video. Now, how do I think to solve the power supply? This tablet has three power connectors. One is a classic 2.5mm DC connector for the original charger that comes with the device. The other is a USB port that also supports charging. And the third is the battery connector. The first step is to check if this tablet can function when connected to the charger only, without the battery. So, since I have one functioning display with a broken touchscreen for this model, I will use it for some initial troubleshooting. I connect the display to the motherboard and connect the USB charger. Here we can see how it shows charging even though the battery is not connected. Which is a good sign, so it doesn't need a battery to function. When I turn it on it starts to light up, but after a short time it stops. Which makes me assume there isn't enough power to run it properly but it turned out that the system had crashed, so I had to update the firmware. I will publish the firmware process in a separate video. If you are interested in the flashing procedure, let me know in the comments. Follow this channel, click that little bell to get notified when a new video is released, and make sure to like this video. 
And I will definitely put the link in the description of this video after the firmware update video is uploaded. Of course, I tried to turn on the device again after the firmware update with USB charger and without battery. I didn't get a stable power supply, but I am not eager to make it work with the USB charger. Actually, I'm avoiding it to use USB for power. I am planning to maybe use a USB keyboard or USB mouse to control the smart TV box, or maybe to even connect some other USB device to it. We'll see. I gave up on further attempts and now we are going to bring the power supply directly onto the battery connector. I took one USB cable, I cut off the micro USB connector, I stripped the wires, plugged the USB cable into a charger, identified the positive and negative terminals, positive is brown wire and negative is black wire. It doesn't have to be the same coloring on every cable but it needs to be checked on every individual cable, FYI. The next step is to solder the bare wires to the motherboard. Positive to positive, negative to negative. Unfortunately, I recorded this badly, but I hope you understand what's to do. It looks like this in the end. Of course, when I turned it on, it only flashes briefly because it's not powered enough by the charger I used. But first let me try something else. And that else is since I don't have the original 2.5mm DC charger and since it's already on my hand <laughs> I will solder the positive and negative terminals directly to the 2.5mm charging connector. I distinguish them by the negative terminal being the outer one and connected to ground of the motherboard. And the positive is the middle pin. And now let's see if it works. And as you can see, same situation as before. The current conclusion is that the display is a big consumer of power. And that I should try without it. To test my theory, I will connect the device to a monitor. And since the monitor I will use for the test does not have an HDMI port, I will use a HDMI to VGA adapter. Now, I have another problem. My HDMI to VGA adapter has only a regular HDMI port and this tablet has a mini HDMI connector. I need a mini HDMI to HDMI adapter. Very simple procedure. Clear? Clear. Let's move on. There is a buzzing. Something is happening. It is important to constantly look out for the white smoke and to notice where it comes from. From what component? Because if the white smoke comes out of it, it means something has gone wrong. <laughs> All electronic devices run on white smoke. If the white smoke leaves, the device stops working. Of course, I tried everything with more types of chargers from different manufacturers, with chargers from 5 volts 1 amp to 5 volts 2.4 amps. I reconnect the battery regularly throughout the procedure just to check that the device is still functioning, just in case that I have noticed that white smoke leaving the device. Of course, it works with the battery. Now that I have already turned on the device, with the battery and as you can see after I install the new firmware it is necessary to do the initial setup of the device. Now I connect the OTG cable, it's just a micro USB to USB adapter, <laughs> to connect a USB mouse and set the initial configuration using the mouse. Let's just go next next next. It even has the Wi-Fi signal despite the Wi-Fi antenna not being connected. But in order to be able to type everything I have to adjust the position of the image on the monitor, but it turned out that without an antenna it could not establish a stable Wi-Fi connection to do the authentication, so I'll skip the Wi-Fi setup for now. I set the date and time, and as you can see the video was recorded a long time ago. And we go into a graceful shutdown to turn it off decently. I desolder the battery and the soldered wires on the charging connector again. Ok, since I'm giving up to power it over the 2.5mm DC connector, let's go back to the battery connector. Since each battery has some kind of electronics on it, so does this battery. In most cases, that electronic component protects the battery from overcharging, controls charging, power and temperature. Electronic specification vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. And in this case, I didn't find a suitable datasheet to check exactly what role the electronics play on this battery. Although I'm pretty sure I can run without it, but since I'm already wasting my time on nonsense, then I'll do it properly. 
So it is worth a try, I guess. What is the goal? Between the charger and the motherboard to solder the electronics to possibly trick the device to think that a real battery is connected to the device, if the battery electronics play any role in that. So I want to remove the electronics from the battery. To take it off, I have to first release the electronics from this heat resistant tape. I use an ordinary razor cutter and carefully cut the tape and be careful not to pierce or puncture the battery cell. When I cut the tape a little bit, I start peeling it off. Yep, I still have to use the chops. Now that I've released the electronics, I have to desolder the battery terminals coming out of the cell and which are soldered onto the electronics or this little board. Now I solder the positive wire from the charger to the positive terminal of the battery electronics board and the negative terminal of the charger to the negative terminal of the battery electronics board. I measure the voltage coming from the charger before the battery electronics board. Now I measure the voltage at the battery electronics board output, which is still 5 volts. But let's try. I'm currently measuring 4.5 volts, which is a little too much. After a couple of little attempts, I've come to the only logical conclusion. But right after the commercial break. <laughs> I'm kidding, there is no commercial break commercial brake not found. As the best solution I decided to use a step down converter. The MH Mini 360 can be found on eBay for about well, $1, $1. I've checked some local sellers, they sell it up to 5 euros per piece, so just FYI. So what does this converter do? It is a little device that will reduce the input of 5 volts to the desired voltage and I adjust the desired voltage with this potentiometer here. I think this converter supports input volts up to 24 volts. I will post a link to the datasheet for this device in the video description. I solder the input first, then the output. Everything is neatly marked on the underside of the PCB. Here you can see the current output voltage. And when I turn the potentiometer, the output voltage changes. I set it to some 3.7 volts. I prepare two double wires to connect the converter to the motherboard. I put two wires on each terminal because these wires I use are pretty thin. I solder, I solder it to the converter and then to the tablet motherboard. I connect and turn on. But still, something is wrong. We go a step further into human stupidity. Since I came to a conclusion without a detailed check, that one 5 volt charger that gives 2 amps, it is not able to provide those 2 amps effectively at the exact moment when the tablet asks for it. Then I decided to try a really primitive method and that is to connect two equal chargers in parallel and so I get 4 amps or how much I get it depends on the charger I choose. Yeah. So I take another USB cable and another step down converter and then I take both converters and set both to give 3.8 volts and I solder them to the battery electronics in parallel. To make it even more interesting, I take one charger with two outputs with 2.4 amps on each port. At least that's what is written somewhere on the specs sheet. But we won't really trust that. But we'll try. I solder negative terminal of the battery electronics to the board. I plug the USB cables into the charger. I measure the voltage on the end wires once more and I hope if anything goes wrong that only the battery electronics will be fried. After it didn't work with this one charger, let me try with two separate chargers, two amps each. That should be enough, right? And no, it doesn't work. And kids, don't try this nonsense with multiple chargers at home because this is ridiculous unless you know what you're doing. This is demonstrative in nature due to several inquiries I received. So it's time to take things more seriously at this point. And that means measuring tablet consumption. I will do this by soldering the terminal of the battery electronics to the motherboard and place a measuring instrument between the other terminal of the battery electronics and the motherboard and measure the amps. So when I put everything together as explained, I press the power button and as you can see during the initial boot, the amperage is just above 100 milliamps. As the device starts booting, it's now just above 200 milliamps. Now it exceeds 300 milliamps. Then suddenly it begins to change and vary from 300 milliamps to 600 milliamps. To reach up to 750 milliamps at its peak. 
And those are the numbers that a solid charger could provide. I mean, the maximum amperage I measured in this case. But a slightly more studious approach should be applied here. To be realistic, in this case, it's not worth it to make a science out of it. Especially when I know that the chargers I tested are not capable to respond to such sudden change in amperage no matter how minor these amperages appear. And therein lies the current problem. And these chargers I use in this case can't react so abruptly and can't provide stable supply to this board in the time given. For a sudden jump in the amperage from 300 to 600 milliamps. And here we can see how after all these amperage jumps the situation calms down and the consumption is reduced to some 100 up to 300 milliamps. And the battery voltage is 3.8 volts. Let's now compare this to a set of two chargers. Here you can see we also have 3.8 volts. I also soldered only the negative terminal and on the positive terminal I measured amperage. I power on the device and it immediately drops. In other words, it fails. As many times as I try, on several occasions it managed to reach a somewhat of 300 milliamps. But that's it, it can go on. But let's check a little more seriously now. Let's use a power supply from a computer, which has been modified to a test power supply for such purposes. Negative terminal is black, positive 12 volts is yellow, positive 5 volts is red, and positive 3.3 volts is orange. Again, I use the original battery electronics, since I don't want to solder both wires from the power supply to the battery electronics. I solder this one with the clip to the electronics board and attach it to the power cord. And I will solder the other wire. I do this so I can break the circuit more easily if something goes wrong. And as you can see, I solder the 3.3 volt wire. Which should be more than enough to boot the system. Because if you didn't know, the most basic power supplies from computers are able to provide up to 10 amps without much effort. Not to mention more serious power supplies for high-end computers or servers. Server power supplies can provide up to several hundred amps, but we'll talk about that in another video. Now I solder the wires from the battery electronics to the board, turn on the power supply, I put a clamp to keep my connection on the instrument and for some reason 3.3 volts is not enough. Now I connect the 5 volts wire from the computer power supply, turn on the device and we have an identical scenario as with the battery. It works with the 5 volts. We don't have even a scenario where it exceeds even 600 milliamps, but that's because we work with more voltage so less amps is enough. And we will deal with that in a separate video also. Uh, since I'm done with the measurements, I'm going to solder this right and connect the monitor. As you can see the system boots up and it says connect your charger. <laughs> it says the battery is empty. For this I have no explanation at the moment. Maybe the battery electronics got some brain damage or something. And of course I turned off the HDMI output by accident and blocked myself out. Here you can see the available screen resolutions on the HDMI output. Hmm, and the battery is at 18%. Funny. And here what happened in the last 37 minutes with the battery. Let's have a graceful shutdown again. But before I solder the wires to measure the current voltage without load. And as you can see 5.144 volts. Now that I have established that I cannot provide stable power supply to this board with a regular 5 volt charger without making some type of circuitry. It's time to put it into high gear, because this is slowly becoming boring. And the next level is, you probably already guessed, <laughs> so it's a 9 volt charger with 2 amps. Some of you may recognize it from a previous video on how to revive a dead battery. If you haven't watched it, I will post a link in the description of this video. Standard procedure, stripping the wires, identifying the positive and negative terminals. We take that step down converter with, with the soldered USB cable. I desoldered the USB cable because this 9 volt charger does not have a USB port and soldered the wires of the 9 volt charger, positive to positive and negative to negative. I plug it in and set it to provide about 3.8 volts, which is in fact already set up. I soldered the converter directly to the board without the electronics from the original battery. I connect the display to maximize the load, I plug it in and it works. I connect the USB mouse to check that everything works and additionally connect to HDMI 
and check that it works too. And since we have, so far, measured the amperage of previous sources, let's measure with the 9 volts too. Of course, I measure at the output of the converter, so here it is 3.8 volts. And it is clear that on several occasions the current exceeded 900 milliamps. Very close to 1 amp. Let's see how much it consumes in standby mode or in sleep. 0.059 or less than 60 milliamps. Now that we have figured it all out, we just need to pack it all up. I've been thinking for a long time what to use as a case for this smart TV box. By case I mean enclosure. Ideally it would be to make a housing on a CNC machine or 3D printer. But my original idea was to try something stupid. I wasn't very lucky to find something really crazy to use as a housing. As I digged through the sheer shelves of faulty stuff consuming my space, I came across some interesting devices, like one old Nintendo for example. But it was too good to be used for this project. I came across an IBM docking station, but there was not enough space in it. And even one POS printer was catching my eye. But it was impractical because the mainboard could only fit diagonally into it. So I would have to drill holes for the output connectors accordingly. And I couldn't do that because I was already spending too much time with this project. But then I came across an old Linksys router that had a close encounter with one or more Thunderstrikes 7 or 8 years ago. This is version 7 of the VRT54G Linksys router. In the description of this video I will post a link to a tutorial on how to disassemble this router if you're interested. I decided to use the housing of the mentioned router because it does not need to be prepared much. FYI, none of this is planned. Everything happens on the go so we can start. I will use the rear openings for connections such as the HDMI port, memory card slot. There may be a need to drill a hole for the charger. Oh, you could even use this hole for a 3.5mm headphone jack. As you can see, this fits perfectly. The existing holes fit. So as if it were meant for this. <laughs> Destiny. Memory card slot, USB connector, HDMI connector, 2.5mm charging port and power button. It will be a little weird to power on, but certainly it's not intended to be powered on and off often. So that is an unimportant factor. Now I need to figure out how to attach the plate to the bottom of the case and when I assemble it to fit as I intended it to fit, like this. And the first thing that bothers me are these two tentacles here. As you can see I only use the latest technology for removing tentacles. After I removed it I try again to see how it fits now. When I have found the right position I carefully disassemble and mark it. I spare no expense. And this could be what I'm looking for. It needs to be adjusted a bit. But this is some crazy hard steel, so it's not easy to bend at all. First I take the soldering iron with a thin tip. I melt a small hole in the housing to make it easier to screw in the screws. And of course I screw in the screw together with the bracket. Now I repeat it on the other side. And of course I haven't tightened any screws so far, until I've installed all the brackets. Now I mount one on the bottom left. I should place another bracket on the underside, but if you look closer there are contacts on the lower right for Bluetooth antenna, Wi-Fi antenna and battery contacts. So I'm not gonna do that. And in the middle are the ventilation holes. There is not much room for another bracket, but since I have already mounted three brackets. I think those three are enough to keep the board on the bottom housing. Now it is important to just mount the board so that the right side does not slide. And one screw is enough. And I just figured out that all the screws <laughs> will be peeking through the bottom housing. Yay! I think it's time to tighten all the screws. I fit everything to check how it looks. And now I see that I have to move the board one millimeter down. Now to re-measure and move the screw to another location, because the previous one no longer suits me. And now I have to adjust the brackets too. As I used a soldering iron to melt the holes for the screws, bulges appeared that needed to be cut, so the screws with the bracket could be completely tightened onto the housing. I just realized that maybe I shouldn't have cut those two plastic tentacles completely, because I just realized that I need some kind of holder 
in the middle under the board. I'm preparing a hole to set up a screw as an holder so that it keeps the board higher on the side where the connectors are. Very important during such exhibitions is not to over tighten the screws, especially if there is a possibility that the board will be bent too much or deformed outside its intended shape. Now the time has come to do the power supply. First, I want to get the DC connector done so I wouldn't be tied to one charger if it's soldered directly to the board. I will remove the DC connector from some old board from some generic tablet. I found a board on which the connector almost fell off. It was loose like my grandma's tooth. This allowed me to unsolder it with a soldering iron without any problems. Uh, this, of course, is not true. The connector was in terrible shape. So I found another board. I removed the tape to keep it from melting. I hot a the board from the underside of the connector. When the tin melts, I remove the connector with tweezers. Then I plug the charger into the connector and identify the positive and negative terminals with voltmeter. And I start looking for an adequate place on the housing to place the connector. Preferably, I don't have to pinch glue or do anything like that, but no luck in that department. I found a place, sketched the location with my imagination and pierced it with a soldering iron. Cut away the slag, confirm the position and widen the hole so that the connector can go all the way in. Of course, I handle it all neatly with the soldering iron and scalpel. I cut about 15 cm of cable, maybe a little more, not sure. Since the wires are thin and there are four in the cable, I use two for each terminal. I solder them to the connector, then to the battery connector. Of course, I pay attention to properly solder the positive and negative terminals according to previously performed measurements. I mark the exact position where I want to place the connector. I prepare the ground and remove obstructions and obstacles so that the connector fits evenly. I unpack the glue, I confirm the position, I apply the glue and set up the connector. Then I clamp it. A few minutes later, I take off the clip, remove excess crumbed glue. I'm testing the connector. I check the functionality again and solder the wires from the converter to the motherboard. I set up the camera module even though I won't need it. And then I realized I took the microphone off the board. I disassemble everything again, solder the microphone and reassemble everything again. I also solder the original speaker and most importantly, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antennas. I fastened the converter with a plastic tie. Since the tie is bigger than the hole I pulled it through, I widened the holes by melting the plastic between the two holes. When I fastened everything, I cut the excess tie plastic before I put together the final product. Before I put together the final product, I test it one more time. When I confirmed that the device was powered on, I started to put it all together carefully. Luckily, the speaker has double-sided tape on it. I just aligned it in place. I mounted the other side of the case and properly pushed the antennas and cables into the front of the case. And here's what the smart TV box looked like in the end. On the front, it's a good old Linksys router without visible antennas. And on the back is all the mockery <laughs> that, that will not even be seen. All connectors are accessible. And that was it. If you want to see this amazing thing in action, like this video, subscribe to the channel and click that little bell to get notified when the new video is available on the channel. A demonstration of the use of this device will be in the following video. When the sequel is published, I will post a link in the description of this video. If you like this video, leave a like. If you didn't, then don't. If you have questions, ask in the comments. Thanks for watching and until the next video.